yeah so that's i think that's part of my challenge in my work is that people like oh space is this kind of thing that is um it's remote it's separate it's not connected and so this is where i'm going to bring in something kind of <laughs> uh maybe it seems spiritual in a sense and, and 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 if so so be it but our path our path to uh humanity's path to salvation from certain expiration will be because of machines okay because the thing is like i said humans are not so good at combing through hyperdimensional data cubes but we are good at providing context to data and information machines are the reverse Today's guest is Maury Bidja, and if you know his name, uh, it's probably because you read his name mentioned next to Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak in the fall of 2021 when their company Privateer Space came out of stealth mode. And the reason Privateer Space was making waves is because their goal is to help clean up space junk, which is a growing problem that no company has really addressed before. And we get into all that in the interview, but I kind of want to just kind of get ahead of myself here because I approached it with the assumption that if you're listening to this, you already get it. You know why space junk is a problem. But in case you don't get why it's a problem, let me put it like this. So space junk isn't like litter in the street, okay? It's, it's, it's moving at orbital velocity, which as he says in the interview, is about 15 times the speed of a bullet. Now, if your foot kicks a piece of glass on the street, that doesn't do anything to you. But if that piece of glass is moving at 15 times the speed of a bullet, it will literally rip your body apart. Except to be fair, it probably would never even get to you because it would just erupt into a ball of plasma simply by flying through the air. And all the satellites that make up your internet and phone and TV work, um, they're all floating around in this maelstrom of debris in space moving that fast. So yeah, it's a problem. But it's a problem that Mora Bajaj is working on. And luckily for us, he is a ridiculously smart and accomplished guy. Let me just go down his Wikipedia page real quick. Okay, first of all, <laughs> He worked at JPL on the Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey, and Mars Exploration Rover. He developed navigation algorithms for those. He's an astrodynamicist, which he explains better than I could, so I'll just let him do that in the interview. Uh, in 2007, Jaw joined the Air Force Research Laboratory and directed the AR AFRL, uh, Advanced Sciences and Technology Research Institute for Astronautics, through that uh, organization. Jaw has served as a member of the delegation at the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. He's currently a professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics at the University of Texas at Austin, where he developed a program called Astrograph, and it's the first knowledge graph database for space traffic management. He's also been named a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, the Royal Astronomical Society, the American Astronautical Society, many other prestigious groups, and as I said, he co-founded Privateer Space just last year, all of which is to say <laughs> he is a world-renowned expert on how objects move through space, but maybe more than anything, He's just a really great guy with a unique perspective that I really enjoy talking to. So with all that, I'm going to stop talking about talking to him and just jump into my conversation with more of a job. Yeah, I was curious um, how like your worldview was created and like what your background was that sort of led you to, yeah, okay. to kind of be the guy. Yeah. So look, um, right. Par parents, uh, father from Sierra Leone, mom from Haiti, immigrants met in the Bay Area, had me, uh, father was abusive, they got divorced when I was two, visitation rights, he had visitation rights, uh, um, you know, once a month kind of stuff, and my grandparents lived in Monterey, California, um, my grandmother taught Haitian and French to the military there, mm. so we moved to Monterey, and um, yeah, it's like uh, somewhere around the age of uh, seven, my father decided to kidnap me, on one of those visits. Oh and so, um, yeah, cops found me like nine days later, someplace in the Bay area, put me on a plane to my mom. My grandfather had a cousin that lived in Caracas, Venezuela. And so my mom's like, we're not gonna stay in the United States a day longer. We're getting plane tickets right now to go mm -hmm. to Caracas and flee the country so that your father never finds you ever again. Yikes. So, I went to Venezuela at the age of seven, didn't know any Spanish. Uh, my mom didn't either. Um, yeah, and just kind of made ends meet down there, man. It was um, 
kids can be pretty cruel and mean to each other. So, you know, I went through my fair share of bullying and these sorts of things. Eventually my mom went through a few boyfriends and found the dude that she really uh, dug and dug her, this guy, this Venezuelan. And um, so they married and had a, you know, I had a couple siblings, uh, you know, through that, but my stepfather and I did not get along, man. Turns out that I was an angry kid. I had a reason to be angry. Um, yeah, and say so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I had a reason to be angry. And uh, he um, he decided that he was going to put me in a boarding school. Um, yeah, in Venezuela, it was a military school. And um, no, no American had ever graduated from this thing. And um, yeah, 250. So at the age of 12, uh, I went into this boarding school and basically stayed there like all week, maybe weekends I'd go home. Um, the hazing was pretty crazy. It was intense. Um, 250 of us went in and 41 of us graduated. Oh my God. That's like a legit military school. Yeah. Yeah. And so the thing is, is that during this time in military school, man, um, with the abuse and the hazing and these sorts of things, like I, Never in a million years would I put my own child in, through something like that. Um, at some point, it was just pride that kept me in kind of thing. Um, I didn't want to give other people the satisfaction. And, but somewhere when I was 16, I got accused of doing something. I got accused of smoking pot on the premises. I, I never did such a thing. Um, and, uh, but no, nobody, the, the reason I was is because I punished a bunch of underclassmen one of them, uh, one of them's father was like best buddies with the director of the campus. Lo and behold, all of a sudden, you know, here's more of a jaw, the pot smoker. And it's like, well, do I get a voice? Do I get, you want to take your analysis test? Like, no, we don't need any other evidence. You know, you, you've been accused and you know, that's it. And so basically I was uh, kept from going home for three months and during weekends, I'd be put in a room and they just like, you know, shoved food under the door kind of thing. It broke me in ways yes. that I can't even explain on this. That's like solitary and confinement. It was, it was like, I mean, during the week I'd go to class and stuff, but the weekends I was like, yeah, it was bad news. And, um, wow. it, 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 it basically, uh, I got to the point I didn't want to live, man. I just, I didn't care. I didn't want to live. I felt, um, Every, everything that I could possibly cared for was stripped away from me. And in this place of uh, complete, I don't care and I'm not, I have no will to live. I had a, I, I was surprised. And the surprise was I got in touch in this void. I felt endless love and compassion. I had no idea where this came from, hmm. but it was there. It was present. Like you had to look inward and you found that. Oh my God. And I'm like, this is, maybe this is what people call God. This is hmm. some underlying fabric to things. Maybe this is what, whatever the, I didn't have to give it a word. All I knew it was, it was surprising. And I had two choices. Um, one of them was to succumb to my experiences and keep on being the angry kid and let that build and be on that roller coaster, which I could predict where that might head. Or two, choose for my pain to be of service to other people. And that's what I chose. Mm -hmm. In that place, I wanted my pain to not be in vain. I wanted my pain to be able to serve other people. And that's where I started in earnest this path towards where I'm at, where I am right now. Wow. And, and that was mid teens, early teens. And I was 16. I was 16. Uh, 16 years old. Yeah. Wow. So that was like your, your darkest, your darkest place. And then you, you found the light kind of thing. Well, the thing is I've gone to dark places time and time again, but yes, that was the first major darkest find the light kind of thing but that's happened over my lifetime so wow times. that went to a place i wasn't expecting that's that's some deep stuff man that's so, so, so that man. kind of 
that kind of informed, I hate to use the word spiritual, but I mean, would you use that term to, of to define like, okay. Yeah, because right. the thing is, I think all those, I think that is uh, inextricably inseparable. Like to me, uh, spirituality and science and all these things, it's part of one common fabric. And mm. the thing is, um, because it's such a hyper-dimensional thing, nobody has nobody has a hyper-dimensional lens to look at everything, right? And so we choose. And part of that is how we grew up and the biases yeah. and prejudices we were subject to. But it's all one fabric, man, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Would you, would you want to have that hyper-dimensional lens or are you okay with uh, it being the great mystery out there? Here's what I, so here's my honest feeling because the thing is I've always told myself that my goal would be to have this hyper-dimensional lens um, I believe that if I had that, there's no way that I could be in physical form because uh -huh. the thing is I would, I would be free of the illusion that everything is separate and everything's binary and everything's this, I'd be free of that. But that means that I couldn't experience what I'm doing with you right now. Mm -hmm. And so because, uh, there's a lot of pain and sorrow out there, but there's also a lot of joy. I'm kind of I'm kind of wanting to keep on experiencing uh, my existence in this way, so I don't mm -hmm. want to give that up. So, which means that I'm okay with um, wanting to be guarded and keep part of my ignorance. Yeah, <laughs> you know what gets me is um, I have had a chance to talk to uh, scientists and and people in that field, and mm -hmm. I, I think the the overarching narrative that we have in our culture is that scientists are very like numbers and logical and all this kind of stuff but when you get a space person started talking about space it gets deep and philosophical and spiritual really quickly and everybody that that has a science uh career or, or background it seems to it seems to come from that place or they or they, or they at least like explore that place in, in a way that you know they can talk very eloquently and poetically about this stuff but then can get down and do all the calculus and stuff too you know like there's that sort of left brain right brain thing but yeah. it all kind of comes from that emotional spiritual like core belief kind of thing right interconnectedness amongst all things absolutely and you get science nerdy space people together it's like there's a connection there i think i feel like there's there there is almost like a religious connection there like the same way that some people go to church and feel connected to other people like mm -hmm. i feel like space people can feel the same way about space about people can feel the same way that they, that, but just like church people uh they get along uh church people might look at other church people in very weird ways and so the space people they tend to be kind of insular and they look at non-space mm. people in very interesting ways which i think is like total bs so yeah. that's 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 where that's where I I don't mind going in the church, but I but but I don't belong to any specific congregation. If you if you get my meaning, <laughs> yeah, we we get tribal about literally anything. It's that's, easy, man. Yeah, it, it's funny how we we do that as people. We, you know, we're also really bad about is pollution. Oh my goodness! Wow, look at that segue. <laughs> the professional had, just came out. I had no idea you were gonna go there. <laughs> But that is something that I think about, like when, when I think about uh, space pollution and, and let's let's just get into that, because I know that's that's definitely your thing. Um, I always think about like we've done that on the Earth and now we're doing it in space. Like, what is it about our culture and us as people? We just we just have to do that. We just we have no long term thinking, it feels like. Here's here's the thing, man. Um, I do think that. Um, as a species, we, we, there is an inherent competitiveness uh, about stuff, okay. inherent curiosity and these sorts of things. And I think that it can be mischanneled. Um, I look at the whole, the whole, well, not the whole reason, but I, I guess the, the most recent reason that I really started pivoting into this idea of space environmentalism is because I had a very spiritual experience in Alaska and I feel that I was enveloped in this, let's call it this energy. It felt very ancient, felt very indigenous. And it's like in my mind's eye, I saw humanity's uh, history and 
how there was an, uh, an abandonment of this idea of stewardship in exchange for ownership. And the detriment, the detriment to the planet, to life, just by having that change in perspective from being stewards to owning stuff. Because yeah. because because the ownership says, I, I claim rights, right? The owner says, I claim rights. Stay off my blah, 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 blah. You know, this is my thing. This is whatever. The steward claims responsibility. Mm. Rights versus responsibilities. We hear right. that argument quite a bit. You know, and so the thing is, it's like, in seeing how that has played out through history and recognizing that there are pockets of folks, mostly indigenous populations that have not abandoned that intergenerational contract of stewardship and believe in this interconnectedness, that became uh, kind of the, the, the lens through which I needed to look at what I needed to do in my work. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you seem to be very connected to an indigenous um, ideals and uh, are there any like specific, how do I put this? <laughs> is, is there any specific- Very carefully like, because people, people are watching and listening to you. I know, yeah, I know, I must, yeah, I must speak. Um, let me, the reason let I, me, I, let me help you out here, here, because I think I feel where it is that you're trying to go with this, right? Okay. And so the thing is, it's it. like, um, I, I clearly, I'm not part of any uh, specific indigenous tribe. And so in no way, shape or form would I try to culturally appropriate any sure, of these things. Right, However, right. as a human, I still experience stuff. Nobody can take away my own experiences. And so mm -hmm. um, when I'm uh, visiting with native Hawaiians and I see their concepts of stewardship and how they treat each other and their values and principles and how they're very much for empiricism and these sorts of things. And then, then if I spend time with some people from the Diné, the, the Navajo, I mm -hmm. can see some similarities. And if I go to Alaska and I meet some folks that are uh, Anthabascans, um, where, you know, the, the Dena, the, where Denali comes from, right? It's like, there are, there are some commonalities that I see. And so those are the things that I embrace. Those are the things that I celebrate. Um, and that again becomes the foundation of my work. And as you've said, um, back to the pollution thing, right? It's like the pollution happens because those specific people have have now become disconnected from the stewardship and the idea of interconnectedness. And yeah. in some ways, they see they see themselves as being independent from what they do and what's around them. And it's that illusion of independence that promotes people behaving in a way that's not long-term sustainable because it's like, oh, um, that's not my problem. And when I, when, I, when I tell people, look, if you actually believe independence is a thing, which it's not, it's because you haven't looked far enough, mm -hmm. you haven't looked long enough, and you haven't looked deep enough. Once you, once you elongate in those dimensions, eventually you will see that you or what comes from you, it's inescapable. There's no escape. Yeah. I feel like we've insulated ourselves from the consequences of our behaviors and lifestyles in so many different ways. Yeah. Um, I, I always think like if, if you went one month without actually taking your trash out to the curb, what would that look like? You know, because really you just bad. Out, ask of, people out of sight, Sicily, out of mind. Man. Say what? I said, ask people in Sicily when, you know, when, when, when the mafia, like, you're right, exactly. Yeah. It is bad news. Mm -hmm. But the point is, like, everything is so out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and what could be more out of I, sight than space, right? Yeah. So that's, I think that's part of my challenge in my work is that people are like, oh, space is this kind of thing that is, um, it's remote, it's separate, it's not connected. And so this is where I'm going to bring in something kind of, <laughs> uh, maybe it seems spiritual in a sense, and, 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 and if so, so be it. But our path, our path to uh, humanity's path to salvation from certain expiration will be because of machines. Okay. Because the thing is, like I said, humans are not so good at combing through hyperdimensional data cubes 
but we are good at providing context to data and information. Machines are the reverse. They're not so good at providing context, but machines are really good at finding correlations and causal relationships through hyperdimensional data cubes. And I believe that machines will be able to, given, given massive quantities of disparate heterogeneous data, will be able to provide humanity evidence of the interconnectedness. And it's going to make it a lot harder for people to say, that's not my problem. Mm. That is what I think that's our path. Interesting. And by machines, you mean like AI? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Or the, the but, physical but, but, robots. But, but, <laughs> yeah, but my AI is not the artificial intelligence. My AI is augmented. Because right. I, I, th I think the wanting machines to like do, do so many things that it basically removes the human altogether is like stupid. Like anybody who thinks that is dumb. I, sorry, it's just that it doesn't even make sense. So, yeah, yeah, because we're literally replacing ourselves with something else. <laughs> then why are we even still here? And then right? the AI will yeah, eventually yeah, think yeah, the man. same it's thing. Like, right? yeah, yeah. This episode is sponsored by Curiosity Stream. So space junk is bad, obviously, but space travel is a good thing. You might even call it a miracle of modern engineering. Uh, so why not learn about the history of space flight with the series Trajectory Milestones in Space Exploration on Curiosity Stream? Trajectory is a 13-episode series that follows the space program from the very earliest V-2 rocket tests in Germany through the first space flights, Project Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, all the way up to the private space launch companies vying for dominance today. And it's a grand story of mishaps and failures, brilliant people overcoming adversity, and success through technological advancement. And Trajectory is just one of thousands of documentaries on science, history, art, the list keeps going from some of the best filmmakers around the world. And while some other streaming services that shall go unnamed keep raising their prices, Curiosity Stream is insanely affordable at only $14.79 for an entire year when you use my URL, curiositystream.com slash joescottpod. But it gets even better because when you sign up for Curiosity Stream, you also get Nebula, the streaming service I'm a part of, as well as many of your favorite smart YouTubers, where you can see our stuff ad-free and earlier than everybody else, meaning this podcast on Nebula wouldn't have this amazing ad read you're listening to right now. It's probably better for you. Uh, it's also the only place where you can see my Nebula original series, Mysteries of the Human Body, and my brand new series called Forgotten Atrocities, where I take a look at some of the darker moments in human history that you may never have heard of. And yeah, you get both of these services for only $14.79 for an entire year. Uh, I know the economy looks scary these days. You might be tightening the belt when it comes to subscription services, but I did the math. It comes out to $0.62 cents per month per service. Uh, it's almost impossible to get more bang for the buck. So. Again, to get all that, just go to curiositystream.com slash joescottpod. Again, that's curiositystream.com slash J-O-E-S-C-O-T-T-P-O-D. And you can get as lost in their library as I do. So go check it out. And thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting this podcast. Now, back to Moriba. Um, well, so I wanted to get into, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me because my computer crashed. Uh, but the, the, the uh, program that you built to, to track the, the space debris and stuff. Yeah, the, like called? the astro, astrograph. Astrograph, yeah. Can and you then, talk about and that? And Wayfinder and Privateer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what, what can you say about that? I know that- um, Okay, yeah. So here's, here's the thing, right? Um, if you look at the news, uh, space-related news, you will see that over, over the past few years, there's an increase in what's being reported. And there's a lot of he said, she says. The US is like, oh, we have a space force because you know Russia and China are threats. China's like, oh, you know, this whole Elon guy, he's taking over this whole orbit thing with the Starlink. That's a threat. We need a Russia blew up a satellite in orbit and polluted a whole orbit with yeah. like junk because they blew up one of their satellites. So when people are kind of doing the saber rattling and throwing this stuff, it's very escalatory uh, in nature. It's going to lead to conflict for sure, um, mm -hmm. unless we do something different. What bo bothers me is that people are making claims, but are not making the evidence widely available for anybody to draw their own conclusions. You're talking about space pollution? I'm, I'm space pollution, uh, uh, threats on orbit, okay. like all these things. Okay. People say lots of things, but you can't find ev any evidence available to you to draw your own conclusion. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's 
complete and utter bollocks. That's right. crap. And so the whole idea behind this knowledge graph, Astro graph, which now has been, um, I guess, productized in Privateer as Wayfinder, it's okay. about being able to crowdsource multiple sources of information about stuff in space and make that curate it in such a way that makes it widely available to as many parts of humanity as possible so that there is a common pool of evidence from which to draw conclusions in. If the conclusion you draw is different than mine, it's okay, but the basis for the conclusion is consistent. Right now, we don't have that. Right now, everybody behaves based on their own evidence, but it's very constrained. And there's no way that people can come to a common conclusion if the evidence pool is, is disjoint, is yeah. separate, is, yeah. Okay, I get you. Um, so you say this has now become a, a, a part of privateer space. This is now like a, a product of that company. That's where we're going, man. It's like, um, here, here, it's like privateer, it's a platform company. And just like an iPhone's a platform, you have apps like Safari and, 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 and you write mail and stuff. Um, but some people like Chrome, some people like Outlook. So here's the thing. There are massively wicked problems facing humanity right now. And across humanity, there are so many intelligent, smart people that could create knowledge and solutions if they had access to some set of data or information. Mm. So what Privateer wants to do, founded upon this belief of interconnectedness and stewardship, wants to be this platform company that enables developers to develop solutions to these wicked problems where lower their bar of entry. I mean, look, I, go, I travel the world, man. And when I go and talk to people, it's like, hey, I have some cool ideas, but I don't, how do I make that happen? How do I develop like an app that could solve, you know, this sort of thing or that or the other? It's like, yeah, I want to provide that to you. Okay. So, so when they, when they launched Privateer um, and it was in all the headlines and all the articles are coming out, I, <laughs> Of course, everybody had to put it in a way to get people to click on the on the article and whatnot. But it was like Steve Wozniak creates this company that's going to clean up space, and and it's like it puts this vision in your head of like you know robots flying around in space and like capturing space junk and all that kind of stuff. Um, but 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 you're saying it's really more like we're creating a data set and we're creating a platform that then other people can develop on to maybe do the actual gathering and and that that's kind right. Of thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to clear that up. Yep. Uh, so, so there's no there's no ambitions right now anyway for privateer to create rockets or satellites that would clean up what's going on up there yet. So here's or, the, can so you here's, even talk about that? Well, so here's the thing, right? Um, because you know that I am a data renaissantist and I like I like observations because if you want to know something, you have to measure it. If 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 it's unmeasurable, it's unknowable by definition. Mm -hmm. So the thing is. I love having my own sources of evidence. I actually have three telescopes that are remotely operated. One is in New Mexico, one is in Australia, the other one is in Chile. Having uh, sensors on orbit to look down sideways and up would also be beneficial because that's more evidence. And any given independent observation gives you the power to either confirm or refute a belief. And I'm all about confirming or refuting beliefs. So, Yes, part of what Privateer is going to do, aside from being this platform company, is have its own sources of information. Some of that is going to be based on space-based platforms. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, some of this is making me, I'm going to do a callback to a previous interview, but I, um, there's another, it, it seems demeaning to even call her a YouTuber because she's an Oxford astrophysicist. Um, Becky Smethurst. Uh, but she's got a YouTube channel where she, uh, she goes by Dr. Becky. Anyway, okay. I had her on here and we were talking about the whole Starlink thing and how that's, you know, could affect uh, astronomical observations and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, and she was basically making the point that it's like, you know, yeah, possibly, but if we kind of know where they all are, then we can know that, you know, there's going to be a satellite coming over this specific spot at this specific uh -huh. time. Uh -huh. um, she was like, so if there was like a, uh, well, she didn't use the word platform. But if there was a platform where we had access to all of that, then that would be uh, helpful. And that kind of sounds yeah. like what you're doing. Well, so here's the thing. 
So I love that you brought this up. Um, there's, yeah, so, so the answer to Dr. Becky is that that's something that we're actually currently um, working with people to develop is an app that will actually predict um, for any, any, anybody on any part of the planet, astronomer or whatever, will predict over some interval, what is the amount of reflected light from these human-made objects in space, uh, including glints, because uh, mm -hmm. sometimes these things are mirror-like reflections. And, and the thing is, it's like being able to predict what the light, uh, reflected light is, that is helpful. But um, I can tell you that when things have this mirror-like reflection, astronomers have confused that with like gamma ray bursts and that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. um, the planetary defense people who are looking for, uh, they're hunting for asteroids that might impact the earth, right? They now have to go through all that clutter to try to detect the asteroids, which are very dim. So it makes it harder. So the thing is, that, it's yeah. not the predicting of the reflected light is in and of itself is not the solution, but it aids in trying to remove some of the ignorance and confusion when it comes to what it is that's being detected, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that, that makes total sense. I, that's, that's cool. Um, I, I, sorry, I feel like we should maybe step back just a little bit. I'm kind of, we're talk, talking about whatever this. you want, this is your show, man. Well, we're talking about all this. Like we under, like everybody that's listening understands the problem of space pollution, like why it's okay. an issue. And, yeah. and I, I think that probably most of my listeners get it, but just in case there's somebody that, that doesn't like, um, this stuff is moving so fast. It's just incomprehensibly fast to our minds. And what is it? 15 times the speed of a bullet is orbital speed, something like that. Well, so, th so that's like relative speeds between things that might collide with each other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and even the tiniest speck of dust can do a lot of damage uh, mm -hmm. at that speed. So um, people talk about the Kessler syndrome. Is, is that something that you're really concerned about? I see you smile. I know you get asked this a lot, I'm sure, but um, is, that, is, that, is that a, a real concern that a Kessler I'm syndrome just not situation? A fan of the whole, uh, yeah. So here's the thing. Um, let's unpack this a, a bit. So okay. 1957, we launched Sputnik, first satellite, right? Um, we've continued launching things. And um, actually, in many of the orbits, again, I, I'm not a fan of randomness. So where we put satellites, it's not random. We put satellites in specific orbital highways, depending on the, the, the service or capability that we want them to provide. And most of these orbital highways um, are ones where when the thing stops working, there is no off ramp, so to speak. Um, right now, it's like you're in your car, you're driving on the freeway, you run out of gas, friction, tires in the ground, eventually you're going to stop. Okay, that's mm -hmm. going to happen. Um, with things on orbit, when, when, they're, when they can't be controlled anymore, they're just, they keep on going at those speeds, okay? Because most of them are sufficiently high, there's nothing to slow them down. And so that becomes junk. And it's like, well, it costs a lot of money to go up and remove something. So what are we gonna do? Ah, we're just gonna launch something else. And then we'll launch something else. And then we'll launch something else. So from 1957 to 2022, with the whole launching something else's and things, bumping into each other to become smaller pieces, things blowing up, becoming smaller pieces, people blowing up their stuff responsibly to become yeah. smaller pieces. Um, now our catalog is like 50,000 things, you know, ranging in size from cell phone to space station and only 5,000 are working and like 45,000, right, are just, are junk. <laughs> And the thing is, the things we care about, like, I don't know, uh, satellites that are monitoring what's going on in like Ukraine or climate change stuff, or things that are providing position navigation and timing, financial transactions. There is no space vice. There's no force field. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, you know, that means that some piece of junk that's not random might collide <laughs> with this thing. And, and we can't predict when that might happen because we're ignorant. And then it basically renders that service or capability useless. And we don't have 
there's no Walmart of satellites that deliver these capabilities that we can just like fire up and then send back up. So yes, there are very big hazards and we're sending more and more people there, the, the billionaires, the, right, the Jeff Bezos, and it's like people are taking rides and some of my own friends have been on, on these rides and people are like, oh, space, it's, it's like getting in a plane. No, it's not like getting in a plane, man. When I get in a plane, we sit down, let's say, Joe, we're on our way to Europe, man. We're going to have some good, you know, vino rosso uh, on the shores of Lake Como. And so we're in this plane, man. And they're like, oh, well, you know, if the cabin feels a change in pressure, these masks are going to drop down and this, that, or the other, right? So we get that briefing and, you know, water landing, yada, yada, yada. Okay, there's risk, but that's all you hear on the plane. What you don't hear is, and oh, by the way, there are these pieces of junk that are hurtling at like 15 times the speed of the bullet that in ways that are unpredictable might pierce the hull of the, of the aircraft. Vaya con Dios, buena fortuna. Yeah, yeah. We don't get that. But that is the reality of everybody that goes into space now. That's ridiculous, man. And there's going to be more of that. More. Lots more. Lots. So, I mean, outside of tracking it, how long would it take for that to come down over over time? Okay, so if things are, <clears throat> I, I, I don't think- Depending on that orbit, obviously. No, no, yeah. So I don't, I don't think in miles, I'm like a metric system kind of dude. Remember Caracas, Venezuela, that sort of stuff. <laughs> the planet does, except for like the United States. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. Um, things that are like, up to about 500 kilometer altitude to where like the space station is. Um, if something at the altitude of the space station just stops working, um, it's probably gonna take five to 10 years for the thing to be able to like re-enter. If it's like a thousand kilometers altitude, now it's gonna probably take like a century. If it's like above 2000, it's like ad infinitum, man. It'll just be up there forever. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've heard the argument, I would love to hear your comment on this. I've heard the argument that the Starlink satellites that are in really low Earth orbit mm -hmm. are actually over the long term possibly safer than geostationary satellites because those are pretty much never going to come down, whereas Starlink satellites will eventually deorbit and burn up. So that's a true statement. Okay. <laughs> I was just ready to be like, what? I mean, I can say that for effect. What? <laughs> That's our thumbnail right there. Just you. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, oh, one thing I was going to bring up, because um, I think this is sort of somewhat related. Didn't they just announce that James Webb got a little micrometeorite in one of its mirrors? I believe so. Are there a lot of those out there at L1? Because that's sort of like the gathering spot gravitationally yes. and stuff. Well, yeah. So, so. Aha, uh -huh. so, so, so yes, you're onto something. The answer is uh, in great part, yes. And I think people need to hopefully recognize that space is not void. Yeah. Space ain't empty. Like there's dust and all this other stuff. It's like, yeah. That's why I think the whole warp <laughs> speed thing is complete crap. It's like, oh, you know, we're just gonna, we're gonna travel at warp speed. It's like, so here's the deal. Um, chances are, that between you and the star that's like light years away, there's crap in the way. So uh -huh. it's like, I don't know how you do how, how you do the warp speed and not run into something. Even even an atom of hydrogen. Man, it's like, you know, I don't want to be, yes. I, I'm curious if there are any things like that in, in science fiction movies that just, as, as, as somebody doing what you do, just makes you go, ah. That happens all the time, dude. Yeah. Are you even yeah. able to enjoy sci-fi movies anymore or can you kind of shut it off? Well, so if it's like real, like way out there sci-fi, I can do it. Like Star Wars, I love yeah. that stuff, man, yeah, right? Yeah. The sound of satellites going by. Do, 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 do. I love that. <laughs> beep, beep, beep. <laughs> uh, That's funny. Yeah, yeah. It kind but, of makes me think of Wally. -E. Wasn't there a scene in Wally -E where the spaceship like went up and it literally like crashed through a whole bunch exactly. of you know, satellites yeah. and stuff? So but those satellites should be that. traveling at fifty thousand miles an hour. Yeah, I can do that. What I can't do is the um, 
the Matt Damon, you know, I'm going to science the shit out of it kind of stuff on Mars and like growing potatoes. And it's like, come on, man, you would have died a long time ago. Like, <laughs> no. Um, you got a lot of stuff on Mars or have been involved with that. I have. Yeah. Yeah. I have no follow up question. I just wanted to say that. Okay. You have stuff on Mars. Booyah. I have stuff over there. It's not the same. <laughs> anyway. Nice. Um, was there anything else you wanted to, to chat about while I, while you have the ear of the world or Look, the, um, a few thousand people might listen to this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I just wanted, I just wanted to see where our conversation went, which I'm always wanting to do that. I'm really interested in connecting with people. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about our connections. Like that's mm -hmm. the reason for anything is our, what connects us. Um, I wanted to at least talk about some of these wicked problems and try to do so in a well in a way that uh, is kind of compelling enough for people to do curiosity and find try to find out some more and hopefully allow people to experience empathy, the ability to project yourself into the perspective of of another kind of stuff and dare I say and uh, you know in a moment of weakness feel some compassion towards trying to solve these things and. Um, I know that it can be overwhelming. And the thing is you turn anything that you turn on, it's nothing but problems, yeah. but we can do a lot to solve these things. We can do a lot to reverse the damage that we've done to ecosystems. Like it's, it's beyond hope. Like we can actually make things better if we just uh, go beyond being to doing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so. Well, say that somebody listened to this and wanted to get involved in some way, like what, what kind of things could they do either through privateer or whatever? Yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, one of the, one of the things for sure is um, this idea of how space is being utilized unbeknownst to most people, aside from just getting educated about it is, I mean, having conversations with elected officials and um, at least being able to, voice opinions even on blogs and stuff saying hey this is this is happening and i don't agree or this that or the other it's like let your feelings and thoughts be known put it out there it's very easy these days to just put out an op-ed this that or the other it's like make yourself known like mm -hmm. make your voice heard um nobody's just going to reach out and make that happen for you you have to do that for yourself and i'm begging you you know the whoever's listening i'm begging you to uh, exercise your responsibility as a steward of Spaceship Earth and let your voice be heard. Love that. I love the whole thing of, of stewardship versus ownership, that sort of mindset shift. I think that's definitely something we need to embrace as a culture, for sure. And it Amen. starts right here. That's right. <laughs> um, Sorry, just real quick. I thought this might be something you would be interested in, or I would love to hear your your thoughts on it. Um, when you were talking about like the indigenous cultures and stuff, and uh, it made me think of this. There, there's a there's a series that I've been wanting to do for a while. It's just a matter of having the time to do it. I haven't had a chance to yet. But um, the uh, I want to go around to like ancient spots in North America, mm -hmm. um, because there there's places here in North America. Most of the people think of like the Aztecs and Mayans down in, in you know, Mexico and Central America, mm -hmm. but there are actually places in North America that um, go back as far as the Egyptian pyramids. Mm -hmm. and, and there were cultures here all this time, and we don't really know much about them because they were kind of gone by the time the, you know, the like Europeans the got here and everything. The Anasazi, the, um, the Mississippians, mm -hmm. uh, Cahokia, Poverty Point, yep. uh, Chaco Canyon is one of these places yes. I want to go to. Yep. Um, I used poverty. to go, that used to be my name, my background, man. Like I used to like roam around four corner area a oh, lot. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I got a Sedona shirt on here. Yeah. Well, you know, there you go. Sedona's gorgeous. Yeah. Sedona looks like every Roadrunner cartoon you've ever seen come to life. Like it really looks like that. Right. <laughs> I'm with you, man. I was just like, this is, this must be where they went when they did the Bugs Bunny. Cartoon. I think so. Yeah. So you want to do this project. You want to go to these places. Yeah, I do. Um, the, the first one specifically, just because it's probably closest, is Poverty Point, Louisiana. That's the one that goes back like to like 5000 BC or something like that. 
Mm-hmm. And, and what, what kills me about it, or what's really fascinating is that there are all these artifacts that they found around there that were from hundreds of miles away. Um, Cause it was like an advanced trading network from like the Edwards Plateau in Texas, all the way up to the North Mississippi. Like they all kind of went down these rivers and they all traded there and stuff. And it's just like, there mm-hmm. was this whole thing going on for thousands of years. Yeah. And we know so little about it. That's just mind blowing to me. So you want, so, so your purpose of going to these places, you want to expose that and like bring it to like, try to. Okay. I kind of want to open people's eyes up to like how long the cultures were around here that that we don't know yeah, about. Good. And if I can possibly do it, tie it into the indigenous tribes that, you know, kind of lay claim to those lands now or, you know, kind yeah. of came from there. Um, that's just fascinating I think, stuff to me. I think that would be good. Uh, one project that I want to do is called Shifted Space, where it's a TV docuseries that I'm trying to put together where um, I'm like a Tony Bourdain for space. I just go around the world and have real raw, rough conversations with people. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing if that develops. That is awesome. Let me know if I can help in any way. <laughs> well, of, co- of course you can. No, that, right? That'd be amazing. Okay. Well, on that, how about I wrap this up and, and let you get on, but, but more about, dude, I, th- this is amazing. I, I really did appreciate this. And uh, uh, no, I had a lot of fun chatting with you, man. The world's a better place with you in it. And oh, like wow. You Look at doing. you. You try to hey. make me blush, man. Well, dude, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man. All right. I appreciate you. Best Thank you so too. much. Let's, let's do this again for sure. What a cool, cool dude. Uh, I just, I, I love that he was so comfortable um, opening up about his life and his journey. I love his perspective on the world. And you know, it, it, it really does blow me away. It shouldn't at this point, but it blows me away to hear such accomplished scientific minds speaking so passionately and, and, and eloquently about life and the universe and the bigger picture. You know, I, I really think deep down inside all scientists are poets and Moriba is a perfect example of that. So I want to thank Moriba for his time. It was a true pleasure to get to talk to him. Hopefully we can do it again sometime. This episode was produced by Kimmy Britt, edited by Bray Brown. I'm Joe Scott. You can find me at Answers with Joe pretty much everywhere on the socials. Of course, my YouTube channel is Answers with Joe. Uh, And I also have the uh, Conversations with Joe YouTube channel. If you're just listening to this on audio, go check that out too. Um, You get to see my face talking to these people. There's actually a lot that you probably miss with the face and stuff like that. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening. Do please share this if you thought this was interesting. And a nice review on whatever podcast player you're listening to right now does go a long way. But until next time, thanks. Have a good one. Now go out there, start some conversations of your own. Take care.